Good evening, everybody. I'm David L. Ulan. I'm the books editor of Alta Journal, and I'm really excited about tonight's conversation between Sarah Shunlin Bynum and John Freeman for the California Book Club. Um, before we get to that, I want to go over a couple of things. I want to introduce Alta and the California Book Club for those of you who are here for the first time and don't know about what we're doing here. Uh, Alta is a quarterly journal dedicated to the culture and life of the West, California and the West. Um, and we also are doing a lot of um, online coverage on a daily basis, um, including an enormous amount of book coverage, reviews, features, um, interviews, et cetera. Um, the California Book Club is, is sort of an outgrowth of, of those efforts to cover, to cover books. Once a month, we, uh, John Freeman hosts an interview with um, a California writer about um, a, a significant California book. I'm particularly um, delighted that, to have this book be the, the choice for January since it was the first book that we reviewed in um, the, for the Monday book review when we launched that online in October of 2020. So it feels like a real homecoming or, or a full circle. I'm also thrilled that Stuart Dybeck, one of, uh, a, one of my favorite um, fiction writers is here as a special guest. It's gonna be a really special night. So thank you all for being here. Um, we, I wanna thank our partners. Uh, we couldn't do this without them. Um, and so I'd like to acknowledge um, Book Passage, Books Inc., Book Soup, Bookshop, Diesel, a bookstore, the Huntington USC Institute on California and the West, the Los Angeles Public Library, the San Francisco Public Library, Narrative Magazine, Ziziva, and Vroman's Bookstore. Um, I also want to let you know about a sale for California Book Club members. For just $50, you can get a year of Alta Journal. You can get the California Book Club tote bag, uh, which is a beauty, zippers, um, Velcro pockets for your pens, um, and one of our upcoming California Book Club books. You can look for that at altaonline.com slash tote and watch tomorrow's thank you email for a link to this great deal. I also want to remind everybody that we have a ton of great book coverage or a ton of great coverage um, around likes and around uh, Sarah Shunlin Bynum as we do a, a, about all of the authors in the California Book Club. So please um, take a look, go to californiabookclub.com. You can read essays and excerpts of the book and our coverage of the book. Um, so please make sure to take a look um, at that. And um, with no further, with that, I'll, I'm, without any further ado, um, I'm gonna introduce John Freeman, the host of the California Book Club, who will take it away with the interview with Sarah. Um, John, welcome to the first California Book Club installment of 2022. Thank you, David. Happy 2022, everyone. Um, I hope everyone's warm and safe, cozy where they are. Uh, when we were thinking about how to start this year, um, we really kind of wanted a, a, a book that would re calibrate us as uh, readers because it's such a peculiar time and it's a very odd thing we do looking at marks on a page that take us someplace into someone's interior world someone who often did not exist and so we wanted a book that basically made us feel like readers again a book that uh, transported us a book that made us feel that kind of slippery edge of seduction, um, both the, the, the comforting feelings of it, but also the, the slight fear and the terror in it, and the way that in that form of enchantment and reading that you sometimes get something you bargain for um, and, and some other things you don't, um, shadow feelings, ghosts, um, myths that sort of reawaken um, all these things come alive in the work of Sarah Shunlin Bynum. Across three books, uh, Madeline is Sleeping, her debut, which was up for the National Book Award, Mrs. Ms. Hempel's Chronicles, which um, I think has resurrected seventh grade teachers everywhere uh, with the complexity of their inner life. And now this exquisite collection of stories, Likes, which we're gonna be talking about tonight which, as with all of her work, proceeds in tones of, of fable and fairy tale, but also quite realistic stories um, set among couples uh, living and working in Los Angeles, um, a, a mother taking her daughter shopping, um, uh, a, a father looking through his daughter's Instagram account, 
um, the breezeway between the fabulous and the everyday uh, is tighter and more neatly oiled than ever before in these stories. And they ask sort of fundamental questions. Um, I think the, the most basic of which appears in The Young Wife's Tale, which reprises the story of a, a girl looking for her, her prince. And it goes, does, could enchantment take hold among the milk crates, the sickly house plants, the student loan statements? When the match sparked and the wick flared, all Eva saw was her husband's face, neither stunning nor monstrous, the face that she loved. Wax did not drip from her candle. The spell went unbroken. He stayed right where he was, fast asleep. Uh, you won't stay asleep reading these stories if you've read them yet. Um, please join me in welcoming Sarah to the, um, to the show. Sarah, hi. Hello, um, John. <laughs> Hi, it's so lovely to be talking to you face to face. Um, and I'm just, I'm so honored to be here. I was so excited to be kind of included in the constellation of authors that the California Book Club has, has, has honored. And, and I'm just, I, I couldn't be more excited to be talking to you, to be talking to Stuart. Um, so, so thank you for making this all possible. Thank you to David for uh, uh, reviewing my book back in October. And, and I'm so, so grateful to Alta for giving this platform to California writing. Oh, it's such a pleasure. It's really, really nice to have you here. And, um, you know, I, I want to ask you just to start off with about um, about these stories and about the, the title. I know it goes with a, a title, this title story, likes, but there are likes across all of these stories, sort of affinities. And um, I know enchantment's a word that you probably get a little bit tired of in describing what you do, but, you know, when you're being um, seduced into a story with sort of dark undertones. One of the things that you, these stories seem to all, 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 if not celebrate, then certainly acknowledge is, is that within those um, dangerous uh, juxtapositions or, or, or relationships, there's also a deep pull of excitement and like. And I wonder if that's sort of something you're exploring to some degree. I do, I do, I did hope that the title would take on a more expansive meaning, meaning um, for the collection as a whole. So, so it, in, as, as the title of the story, it's referring very specifically to the idea of social media and thumbs up and thumbs down. But, but I, I did, I did hope that by removing it from that context and and asking it to speak to all the stories, it would be raising all of those questions that that you have articulated. And I think for me, one of the forces that pulls me back to writing again and again is the nature of obsession um, and is the nature of sort of following one's predilections, like listening to one's inner voice, uh, uh, giving you permission to pursue those sometimes peculiar things that please you. Uh, so, so I, I do think like that idea of, of what, what, what pleases us, like what, what ignites us, like what um, continues to attract us uh, is, is something that, that excites me because I think like as a younger writer, I had a certain anxiety about, well, if I write about something once, then I need to move on to the, the next subject. Like I, 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 I've done that one treatment and then I need to um, progress. And now having done this longer, I think one of the acceptances that I've relaxed into is the acceptance that I am going to keep returning to those same wells over and over again. The things that I like are the things that are going to energize me to put words to paper. Um, and, and that I just need to 
give into that, relax into that. Um, so, so, so yes, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that the title sort of for you took on that bigger sense. Oh yeah, absolutely. It sort of ripples across all of the stories, like as acceptance, like as curiosity and fascination, like being actually like each other. You know, there are stories in which there are girls who are friends who are in some like uh, some in some ways alike, and then they gradually realize one of them is taller, one of them, you know, is Japanese, one of them, you know, starts to progress more rapidly sexually, uh, and so the, the, the meaning of like changes. Uh, and I think one thing that unites a lot of the stories is just, um, is one thing that you do that, that almost all writing teachers uh, sadly tell writers not to do, which is that you often have two, at least, um, you often have more than one point of view in a short story, which is kind of like splitting the atom in the short story. <laughs> And I wonder if you can talk a bit about that. I mean, Madeline is sleeping. Your first book takes place while this girl is sleeping and we kind of go in and out of dreams. And I, I guess I want to ask where that sense of porousness uh, within narration emerged for you, where that sense of freedom to do that, uh, because it's, it's often something that when writers are starting out, their teachers say, make it easier on yourself one point of view, stick to a point of view and 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 stay there. And and John, I was one of those writing teachers <laughs> who really preached the gospel of a, a focused point of view. Um, and in fact, if I'm I'm to, to share a story from my first writing workshop and Stuart was the teacher in that first writing workshop. The, the, the first manuscript that I turned in um, was a story that had a meandering point of view. It followed a family um, on vacation and the perspective sort of drifted from one member of the family to another. Um, and the story um, was diffuse, it, I guess would be a, a kind way of putting it. And, and my workshop members really pointed out how this very um, scattered point of view made the story feel unfocused. And now this is gonna sound apocryphal, but it, it really is true. The next manuscript that got turned in in this workshop was a story by ZZ Packer called Brownies. And this story um, just was electrifying as when I first read it on a Xerox sheet as it is when I return to it now in, in which and I've returned to it so many times. And, and one of the things that I realized that gave Brownies, its power was the strength of the voice and the way in which the point of view really focalized the story. So with my next story for Stuart's class, I made a totally different set of choices and I really embraced close third person of a single character. Um, in this case, it was the character of Miss Hempel. This was sort of her um, um, uh, debut and that that discovery of like oh when I make a strong choice with point of view and I really commit to point of view it brings the rest of the story into a kind of sharp focus um, that that my attempt at a sort of Virginia Woolf to the lighthouse um, drifting perspective did not achieve with that earlier story. Um, so for years, I faithfully practiced close third person, single point of view. Uh, and, and, and I just loved the variety of, of effects um, one's able to create with that. Um, you know, James Wood often refers to it as free indirect style. Um, and, and so that's another term for it, but I just, I just loved um, the, the, the possibilities and the flexibility of that point of view. Um, but then I think, 
um, I started to get a little restless after being this um, very faithful practitioner. Uh, and, and especially the combination of having stuck to that approach myself for so many years and also taught it uh, as, 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 as a writing teacher um, with such fervor for so many years, the, the, the importance of committing to a single point of view within the small space of a story. Um, you know, one starts to feel a little like rebellious, you know, against one's own precepts, right? <laughs> and so I think, um, a lot of the, the playfulness with point of view and the experimentation with point of view that happens in these stories absolutely grew out of my decades long faithful embrace of <laughs> close third person single point of view. <laughs> but it, it actually makes sense so much too, given um, the stories that you're telling. I mean, the first story is a mother and daughter who sort of gone shopping together and they're they're practically joined by hands but they're having completely different experiences of what they're doing and i wonder if you can talk a little bit about that and just where the american short story if you identify yourself as the practitioner of such comes from because from my point of view to some degree the story comes from poe in america you know mm -hmm. it, it it emerges almost out of um horror and the effects that that Poe created, and that, if you agree with that, do you, what does that mean for the sort of um, epigenetics of of the sort of practice that you're doing when you're when you're using this device? Yeah, um, and Poe, I mean, he he talked about the the unity of effect, like that was that was something that was so important to him. Um, I. I I, I think that I sort of draw as much upon the American short story tradition um, as I do upon storytelling traditions from, from other languages and from, uh, from other cultures. So, so, you know, on the one hand, I embrace that lineage of Poe and, and, and especially, um, the ways in which um, um, horror and the fantastic uh, uh, creep into his work. Uh, you know, or even someone like Nathaniel Hawthorne, I remember reading The Birthmark um, and just being so haunted by that story. Um, so so, so I, I love how these early American writers don't have necessarily kind of strict senses of, of genre, that there is a kind of, to use your word, sort of porousness with genre in terms of how the, the um, earlier American short story writers are, or, or, or Charlotte Perkins Gilman and the yellow wallpaper. I mean, but it's so interesting to me because I feel as if as the American short story then evolved and, and um, developed into the 20th century, some of these um, um, generic uh, delineations became a little bit more strictly uh, uh, enforced in some ways. Um, so I, I, I and, and maybe that has more to do with how, how critics were writing about American short fiction than, it, than, than the writers themselves were. Um, but I do feel as if like when I was a student first being introduced to the short story, I was introduced to it via Hemingway in our time. Um, I, I was also, uh, one of the early books I read was, was Raymond Carver, uh, Susan Minot, um, and Beatty. So I, as a, as a young writer, associated the short story so purely with that particular branch of American realism. Um, and it wasn't until much later when I first read Italo Calvino or Borges or Angela Carter that I began to realize that the short story can sort of um, 
be a form that doesn't have to be inextricably uh, uh, bound to the conventions of naturalism and realism. Um, so, so am I answering a question at all, John? I'm sorry, it's so fun to sort of think about all the many branches of the tree. Um, but it is, it's, it's like a sort of, um, it's like the, the, the short story has a kind of overstory in which all these forms of storytelling, which seem to you know, uh, be, have representations across your work, because your three books are not the totality of, of your work. Um, there's things that you've written that are uncollected. And um, it, it, it feels like uh, one of the things that differentiates your work, perhaps, from other writers um, in, in the United States of your kind of age group is just how much you've just blown open the doors between the ways of telling stories. And so this this first story in your book, um, which I'd love to hear you read from, you know, it does feel, you know, like it comes from the Angela Carter slash Stephen King school of little girl who sees a guy across, you know, a, a, a an open green wearing a cape which is neither dark nor light and has the color of night in it and it's just it makes her hair stand up because her mother doesn't see her see this man would you like me to read from the opening yes please so this is a story called the earl cake it is just as kate hoped the worn path the bells tinkling on the gate, the huge fir trees dropping their needles one by one, a sweet mushroomy smell, gnomes stationed in the underbrush, the sound of a mandolin far up on the hill. We're here, we're here, she says to her child, who isn't walking fast enough and needs to be pulled along by the hand. Through the gate they go, up the dappled path, beneath the firs, across the school parking lot and past the kettle corn stand into the heart of the elves fair. Her child is named Undine, but answers only to Ruthie. Ruthie's hand rests damply in hers and together they watch two scrappy fairies race by, the swifter one waving a long string of raffle tickets. Don't you want to wear your wings? Kate asked that morning, but Ruthie wasn't in the mood. Sometimes they are in cahoots, sometimes not. Now they circle the great shady lawn, studying the activities. There is candle making, beekeeping, the weaving of God's eyes. A sign in purple calligraphy says that King Arthur will be appearing at noon. There's a tea garden, a bluegrass band, a man with a thin sandy beard and a hundred acorns pinned with bright ribbons to the folds of his tunic, boys thumping one another with jousting sticks. The ground is scattered with pine needles and hay. The lemonade cups are compostable. Everything is exactly as it should be. Every small elfish detail attended to, but as Kate's heart fills with the pleasure of it all, she is made uneasy by the realization that she could have, but did not secure this for her child. And therein lies a misjudgment, a possibly grave mistake. Uh, thank you for reading that. Um, if you can tell in that passage that Sarah just read, there, there's a, an almost beveled quality to your language here that it you know, if you put line breaks in some of these paragraphs, you could you could run them as poems. And um, as as much as your stories are paying close attention to the moment that they can kind of pull us under, you know, or sweep us through into you know the other <laughs> the other room where where the rules of reality don't necessarily apply, they're also looking very closely at the surface of things at the sort of the, the arrangement of the surface of things. And I wonder if you can talk about that because this, this collection also has 
quite a few stories about adult life and adult life in the context of Hollywood, for lack of a better word. Yeah. You know, the sort of adult version of that kind of play date that the, the um, mother and daughter are, are on in the first story appears and reappears in the form of Hollywood. And I, I wonder if there's any kind of connection for you between the fascination um, described in looking at surfaces very closely and also uh, the, the, the messages and the, the lure that Hollywood has, not just for people working in it, but for us who consume its products. <laughs> a writer who um, tends to rely really heavily upon sensory detail. Um, I think it's also because just uh, as, as the way my mind works and the way my memory works, it, it really, re it, it, it heavily depends upon um, my five senses. So the smell of something will suddenly conjure up a lost association or a lost detail of a, uh, or if I'm trying to um, recollect uh, a particular event, you know, I'll often try to remember like, oh, like what was the music playing when that dinner conversation happened? Or what was the album that came out that summer? Like I, I'm, I'm always trying to use um, sound and sight and smell and sensation as the, the sort of um, compass by which I am able to, to, to revisit past experiences. Um, so, so I think for me, I, I really lean on them as I'm writing um, because they do become these sort of guideposts that end up often leading me to where I'm not expecting um, because they can open up these portals into the past, into memory, into um, associative thinking. Uh, so, so my sort of fascination with surfaces and my, and my fascination often with objects, um, I think springs out of my um, habit of sort of trying to gather as many sensory details as I can uh, as, as, a, as a way of, of um, entering into or accessing a space that is sort of beyond the logical or the everyday. Um, and, and I think the kind of surfaces that, that Hollywood uh, traffics in um, is a different kind of surface, but but as someone who is like a lifelong like lover of Hollywood movies, they have like entered my vocabulary of sensory memory. Um, so so I don't like you know I know that that um, Hollywood's often maligned for being a place that's inherently superficial or a place that that um, values surfaces over depth. But for me, it's the surfaces that allow access to depth. So, so I don't sort of see it as being um, sort of inherently inimical to um, genuine experience or, 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 or genuine sensation. Um, I see the sort of beautiful enchanting surfaces that Hollywood manufactures um, to be just as sort of rich a material as the wooden toys at a Waldorf fair, you know? <laughs> oh, it's, it's so nice to hear um, because uh, you know, the ho film and television is such a, a big part of so many of our lives. And I think that the thing that film and television cannot do is it, it cannot tell us what uh, someone who works in the garden of a Los Angeles home smells like 
arriving at work early, at, you know, and how his shirt might smell smell of laundry the way that the character does in the in the second story. You know, tell me my name, um, and and the juxtaposition of that scent with the garden and the work that's happening to maintain the house. It does all the work of having to explain, you know, the kinds of labor that maintains that place and the 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 labor it takes to remain human <laughs> in the middle of of creating that facade. Um, uh, and and you do that with just one scent, um, which you know a, a film version of that could not do. Um, you know, one of the short story writers, I think, aside from you, who works with the senses better than any other is, is Stuart Dybeck, who's here with us today. He's, he's the author of uh, two collections of poems, most recently, Streets in Their Own Ink, as well as six works of fiction. Um, he's a winner of the Guggenheim, a Lannan, and a MacArthur Fellowship. And he was also, apparently, as I've discovered here, um, one of your professors, Stuart could you come on and 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 talk to us? I think you probably have a question or two for uh, for Sarah. Hello, Stuart. Hey, hey, John. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Wonderful to be here. Hey, Sarah. Hi, Stuart. It's really, really wonderful to see. I know. <laughs> I know. I remember immediately that class when you told that anecdote. <laughs> you weren't writing. You. you 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 were already writing, I think, under cover of darkness. Madeline is sleeping. I was, I was. But it was hard to bring a novel to the workshop. Um, so I started writing short stories. Uh, mm -hmm. and I and and Stuart, I remember at the end of my first um, disastrous workshop after my classmates had pointed out all of the flaws in my wandering point of view. Um, I remember you saying to me, but I'm interested in that one character, that teacher character. Um, she was just one of the many uh, members of the family. And, and it just took you saying that, that one comment just to give me excitement and permission to go down the rabbit hole with Miss Hempel. Um, so, so I will always remember you ending the class with that kind of kindness and curiosity about her. Well, I mean, there were so many things about both those books, Madeline and Madeline is Sleeping and Miss Hempel, that I actually thought about as I read Likes. Um, I mean, in, in each of them, especially the Miss Hempel stories, the relationship between people who were once were children but are no longer children and children is so beautifully explored. And one of the things I thought that was going on in Likes that absolutely fascinated me because it was almost by degrees on how close the, each one of those stories would come to a tale and how much each one of them would stay on the other side of modern fiction that 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 relationship between adults and children um played out i i, I don't know if it was instinctive on your part because i think you've been doing it at least from the start way back then or you know, or how conscious, but it, it is so impeccably done. Um, I, I don't know if I've asked the. I guess I haven't asked it as a question, but I don't know if I've if I've been clear as to kind of what I'm getting at. Let Let me put it um, in one sentence, maybe. One of the things that you play a lot around with in this collection of stories are classic, fabulous tropes. The children's are classic, fabulous tropes. And yet the children in these stories are exceed being tropes. I, I'll stop there. I don't know if you can. Well, I, I think that the, um, the idea of working in instinctually is something that um, 
I really learned to trust from both your work and you having you as a teacher. I feel as if um, your stories are such sort of a, a beautiful lesson in how to listen to the story and to allow the form of the story to arise out of image or to arise out of um, uh, a phrase um, rather than to sort of work in this um, very conscious uh, uh, structured logical way um so 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 for me that that habit of working instinctually was was something i i just so attribute to um being in 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 class with you but also sort of even more lastingly continuing to return to your stories as examples you know I've taught them so many times now, um, but I've also um, just returned to them so many times as I, you know, sometimes will be in my own process and, and sort of be hitting a wall and then I need to be reminded to sort of let go and need to be reminded to, to, to listen to the story, to listen to the music of the story, or to, to return to the image out of which the story first sprung. Um, so, so I think that, that um, the, the fabulous trope of childhood um, is not something that I ever sort of consciously or deliberately um, Marshall in my work. I think it's just the place that that instinct often um, leads me back to. Uh, I, I sometimes my daughter teases me and says that she has a hard time seeing me as an adult because she thinks that I'm still ultimately like a teenager just in like a middle-aged person's body. Um, and, and I do think that that space of childhood, as I was saying to John at the beginning, like that's a well, like the, that my path keeps returning to somehow. Um, and I, I think that, that trusting, like learning to trust one's instincts and not fight them um, was, was, you know, one of the great gifts of, of, being, of being your student. I, 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 by the way, I, I've been teaching your stories now since, I, 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 put, I have a little booklet every time I teach this class in fabulous, right, fabulism, and the, we start out with the Euro King. So, but the, you know, the, your work is loved, your work is a model. And I, I guess that's kind of what I'm trying to talk about. The, um, one of the things that I've noticed in, in, in trying to actually teach, I mean, teach in big quotation marks, for lack of a better verb, um, is certain kinds of transitions in the kind of story you're writing. The, the inventiveness that it takes. Uh, I, I thought the inventiveness, for instance, in likes was, was, was really brilliant. And it's a word I'm guardedly using, you know, hoarding it for things that deserve it. But um, so the story is told through the lens of an adult, a father. And the only way he seems to communicate with his daughter is through these clues <laughs> on Instagram and, 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 and media. And yet he feels that there's this secret world that she has, which might or might not be true. And the transitions that you use there, number one, you've got her wanting to be in the nutcracker. So, you know, now we've got like this one foot in fabulism and the other foot in everyday parenting in the 21st century. And 
one of the things that the stories that were, you know, that you and John were talking about is that they're, they're all about metamorphosis. They're about transformation. So you're reading that story and you're wondering, well, how in the world will this writer where she's got herself, will she or won't she create a transformation at the ending of the story? And the transformation in that story just blows you out of your socks. He, it, and I mean, I, I, that's, I, that's kind of what I'm, I, I mean, that was maybe the primary thing that struck me about that book was how you use the child. It's not just about parenting, it is about parenting. It's not just about children being tropes, but they are tropes. I mean, it's all integrated and going on at once. And, and it's not the same in every story. It's like one story demonstrates this, another story demonstrates that. That's part of what's lovely about the short story, right? Like that you can um, sort of make up the rules anew with each one, but that, I, and I think that's why I love the forum is that it offers so much field for, for play. Um, and, and there's also just so much potential for surprise. So I, I, I do wonder, um, you know, if, if, if it's like the form itself that gives rise to um, maybe some of the, the metamorphoses that you're describing, because I, I don't, um, I, I almost, I almost want to sort of attribute it um, to, to like the very nature of the form that like the, the short story, I mean, I guess, I guess um, the, the, the conventional wisdom uh, that, that often writing teachers uh, uh, will, will say to, to first time short story writers is that the final unwritten sentence of every story is, and after that, things were never the same again. Um, that <laughs> so I think this question of change is, 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 so, is so wrapped up in the form itself. It's like a form that, that requires some form of, of change or transformation. Um, and of course, within like the sort of American naturalist tradition, often that change is incredibly subtle or it, you know, it's like some uh, just very nuanced shift that will happen. Um, but then going back to the tale tradition or the fable tradition, that change can be radical. Um, and so I, I think one of the things I love about the short story form is how it, it, it sort of drives me towards thinking about how is this transformation going to happen? Um, and in what new way can it happen? And, and I never know when I start writing what shape it's going to come in. I don't know if it's going to be one of those uh, very quiet <laughs> transformations or if it's going to be something um, that's much more astonishing. Um, but, I but I think that's one of the things I love about the form is that it, it sort of sets me on the path towards thinking about, like towards being alert to the possibility of, of transformation. Um, one, of the, one of the transformations in your story for me is that in your, in your writing, and especially in this book, was um, going, again, going back to the thing that you and John were talking about, is that there's, um, Let me back up one bit. So, um, one of the, one of the, th there, there was a guy in Iowa long before your time named uh, Arnost Arnost Lustig. He arrived there after Dubček fell. A whole ton of Czech writers came to the International Writers Workshop. They had nowhere else to go, and Arnost was there. 
it survived uh, Auschwitz, he had survived uh, other concentration camps, spectacular man. And I taught with him in Prague later. And he always had his students, no matter what workshop he was teaching, begin by with a fairy tale. Mm -hmm. And I was so impressed by this guy that when I was trying to teach this class, I asked my students to do that. And I, I never had the success he did with that. And one of the problems was, especially for undergraduates, is if you tell them something like that, several of them try to copy the fairy tale. And it, it's a dead end for a lot of women. Yeah. Because to actually try to copy a fairy tale where the knights and the kings and the princes and everything rule, I mean, it's easy for the guys in the class. It's deadly for the women. So like one of the things that's going on in your work is you, you have solved that problem over and over and over again. I don't know, uh, you know, again, it's a question, it's a kind of a question, are, are you, I mean, that was really clear to me in that Tin House issue, um, that the, the story um, about the woman and, and, and the, the, the king uh, at first appeared in. But I, I mean, uh, it, again, is, is that something you consciously went after to just say, look, you know, we, I, I wanna hang on to the tail, but I don't wanna be in this stereotype. And that Tin House issue, uh, that was that was a the, an issue that was revelatory for me to sort of see all the other writers who were exploring this territory. Like it just, it was so exhilarating to kind of feel like I was part of this um, underground collective somehow that I sort of, we were all working um, um, alongside each other yet, yet not always aware of it was it was just it was so exciting to be in that issue with Karen Russell with Amy Bender with Kelly Link um and and in fact out of that issue um Amy Bender and I ended up becoming very very close friends she's one of my um absolute favorite people but it it, it really all stemmed from that one <laughs> issue of Tin House um, and putting all of these writers together who were all women, all um, playing with the fairy tale tradition in different ways. And I, for, for, for me, again, um, not con nothing conscious. I think for me, um, again, just instinct and the, the, the following the instinct of um, how do I both uh, capture the feeling of um, fantasy that the, the early Disney fairy tales that I grew up with um, always just suffused me with. Like I was an absolute total um, huge fan of Walt Disney Snow White. That was the very first um, record album I owned. Um, I, I used to have a wonderful recording of Danny Kay reading fairy tales aloud, the, the um, Thumbelina and other Hans Christian Andersen fairy tales. So like this was really what I was raised on and not the revisionist feminist version. I was raised on the... Um, <laughs> undiluted Disney version of, of these fairy tales. And I think just by instinct, I wanted to try to tap in to the absolute enchantment that those stories had on me at the time. But uh, as you said, sort of the trap is re-inscribing a lot of those patriarchal uh, energy that 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 just are inescapable in, in those stories. Um, but it's this it's it's realized, I think for me, again, Angela Carter was so pivotal. Pat Patricia Eakins was another writer that was 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 really um, important to me in terms of uh, 
showing me how this tradition actually so predates the Walt Disney and Danny Kay, Hans Christian Andersen stories that I had been raised on, that in fact, there was a much uh, longer, deeper, richer tradition that preceded it. And, and often it was a tradition that was being um, shared and being built upon by women sharing stories orally. Um, and, I, and I think it was sort of that realization that the sort of Disney era of fairy tales is ultimately just like a little blip in this much, much, much longer lineage. Um, and and I, I also just loved the freedom of not having to be original. Like I think as a as a young writer, um, you're you're so worried about being overly influenced by your favorite writers. You're, there's just, there's, there's, there's so much um, hand wringing about uh, finding one's voice and having something new to say. And working within the fairy tale tradition, the whole notion of originality just gets, you know, thrown out the window. Um, there is no such thing as an original fairy tale. It really is about how do you add your own stitch to this big tapestry that so many unnamed storytellers have been crafting together like through time. Um, and so it was just a great relief to, to just to just to discard um, these notions of authors, authorship and originality and and like the lonely um, you know artist working in solitude because with working within fabulism and fairy tales, I always feel as if I'm just channeling other people's voices in the best way possible, not in a derivative way, but in this kind of um, choral way. You know, do, you, do you know what I mean? Well, absolutely. But I, I mean, and, and for me, what you, what, you, what you do so well, and I, and I see you'll take no credit for it, <laughs> is that to make that little new stitch you're talking about, it, is where the huge invention that, I, I mean, that's the invention isn't coming from the fairy tale, as you say, that's there for everybody to use. But what you do with it to, to depaternalize it. <laughs> I mean, what you did with, for instance, the, the, the wonderful properness of the Madeline stories with Madeline is sleeping is, I mean, number one is it's besides being totally rebellious and funky, it's hilarious. And, <laughs> and I, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I feel like that again in a lot of these stories where you are using, um, instead of uh, classic children's books, uh, fairy tales or, or, or something else along those lines, there's just the kind of a very welcome defining myself even as I use the material, re redefining my, Redefining myself against, even as I use it. <laughs> Sarah, just uh, um, I'm going to jump in here because we're getting towards the end of the hour, and there's some questions from the audience. Um, but I I, I want to bring us back to likes very briefly before we um, close, uh, simply because you know just as in Stewart's um, great story Pet Milk, you know the the two characters in that story who fall in love. Uh, and the, and as they're riding the subway away from this dinner they've had, they're they're suddenly aware that the, how are they possibly going to keep this up? How's this feeling possibly going to ever end? Um, and so they're aware of the story that they're trapped in, that they're in the middle of a of a love story. And I think one of the things that um, I would ask you about with, with likes is that some of your characters are aware of the story they're in. You know, in Burglar, um, one of the you know characters in that story is aware that he's being asked to kind of write the sort of stories about black life. 
that that drive him crazy. And so I I, I wonder if, if you can talk a little bit about how you have characters aware of the stories that they're in, um, ra rather than you being aware of, of sort of writing the story. Yeah, yeah. No, and I and I and I think you know to to speak to Stuart's point about how you know a certain strand of the fairy tale tradition has been so constraining to women. Um, you know, narrative can be. Uh, can be as much a trap as it can be a form of escape, right? So, so you know, in that story, um, it's a it's a it's a writer who's who is trying to imagine his way out of reinscribing some of these, you know, really just diminishing narratives about black men in the United States that that either you fit into the 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 archetype of the um, noble long suffering um, wrongly accused the sort of Tom Robinson from from to kill a mockingbird type um, or the only other alternative to that is the type who is somehow a threat or a predator or that 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 they're they're that that, that the narratives are are so strictly codified um, that in order for him to tell this story for his TV show, he 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 has to to choose um, one or another in a in a binary, um, and and I actually found as I was writing this story that I was sort of at the edge of reinscribing a lot of those narratives and tropes like that was my great anxiety in writing a story that that has a burglary in it that has um a quote unquote criminal in it that i was just going to be writing right back into those really destructive narratives and those really constraining narratives is that why you have these um you have you have sort of uh, red herrings strewn everywhere in this book there's there's houses, there's forests, there's castles, there's elves, there's clocks, there's dolls. You know, there's every single aspect of, of, of like the fairy tale. Like if you upended the fairy tale toolkit, like every single bit of it is in Take every single bag. story. <laughs> you know, and, and so just at the point where you think, aha, I know what's gonna happen here. Then suddenly <laughs> this, this uh, you know, one of these images appears kind of out of context and it 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 does all this strange work inside the story it kind of vibrates and I, and I, I wonder if those decisions are kind of deliberate or if again you're writing instinctually in those moments and, and in some ways the the history of this of the craft is kind of channeling through you I, I think it's when, like, as I, as I said before, it's like those moments when you hit a wall and you don't know where else to go. And at, when I was writing The Burglar and I was sort of sticking very um, much within the realm of realism, you know, and I was shifting the points of view from the burglar to the wife, to the husband in the writer's room, um, that that was exactly where I felt like I was about to, step into this quicksand of simply reinforcing and re-inscribing some really destructive narratives. And I was like, how do I keep writing this story without falling into that quicksand? And it's, 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 like when the magical object appears on your journey, just when you feel as if you've <laughs> reached your limit and 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 that was sort of how it functioned in this story like the possibility of a, a imagined character suddenly entering into the seemingly realistic world that had been established that sort of like became the magical object on the journey of writing the story it became the way to 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 
to move forward. Um, it became the way to write out of the narrative trap that I felt myself heading towards. Um, because once the character from the TV show enters into the story, then the energy shifted. Um, uh, you're right, you're right. The, you, both you and Stuart have written um, in very, very short form. Madeline is Sleeping is, is a novel, but it, you know, the parts of it operate like, like what people might call flash fiction. And Stuart's got this lovely book called Ecstatic Cahoots, which um, is, is one of my favorite books of kind of love stories because the accelerant, the accelerant of love is captured in the speed of the stories. But both of you have also, you know, written novels, and one, some, someone from the audience was asking if you could talk about, you know, working in the novel versus working in the short story as a form. How it, um, you know, someone, I, I guess, I sailed with Magellan as kind of a novel in stories, if you will. Um, how do you both feel about those those delineations, or or is it all just writing prose to you? Sure. Well, Stuart, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I think I would call myself a sort of accidental novelist um, in that the two books that I've written that have been categorized as novels were, were both books that um, grew out of the accumulation of much, much, much shorter pieces of prose, but that in neither case did I set out thinking to myself, I'm embarking on a novel. Um, like that's, that just wasn't the, um, the, 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 the canvas that I thought I was working on. Um, I, I tend to think much more as a miniaturist than as someone who works on a really big canvas. And so in the case of both of those books, it was just in a sense, um, the like sort of putting together like a Joseph Cornell box of like taking lots of very small things and putting them together and being interested in how they spoke to each other um, rather than kind of taking like a Jasper Johns approach and making really big brushstrokes on a big canvas. I've, I've always been fascinated by um, the over kind of overlap between um, novels that depend heavily on chapters and works that could be called story collections, but really are somehow not. Um, Waynesburg, Ohio and um, Dubliners come immediately to mind. And the thing that interests me about uh, books like that is that they, they seem ready-made for exploring neighborhoods or, or platoons, the things they carried. Yeah. Th th that, that it's not just the collection of stories, but it's a, there's a spine running through it and you certainly are gonna be able to create characters or a family, which is what I was fooling around with and I sailed with Magellan. But the, before I decided on that title, which is the title of a song that one of the characters makes up in the, in the novel, it was called Little Village, which was the name of one of the neighborhoods I grew up in, a Hispanic neighborhood. And so um, I, I'm not trying to generalize about novels and stories so much as to say that the one that you brought up, John, thank you. I had that kind of form in mind that, that, that had other uh, precedents, but it, 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 did the, it did this particular thing of, of, of making a neighborhood or a platoon or a Winesburg, Ohio, or a little town uh, come to life. Yeah, another story I would recommend from would be from the coast of Chicago called Blight, uh, which is like a, a, a sort of miniature 
novella, I mean, I can't tell if that's a novella or a story. Um, I would love to talk to both of you about the short story as a form for hours, because I feel like we've barely scratched the surface of the, of the, of the exquisite beauty of these stories and how strange and marvelous they are and how intimately they convey their transformation transformations it's a so, great invention it so is and, and i i feel like in your work sarah you see the the depth of what you can do um there, there's a question from the audience uh you know before we go um Stuart, it's for you actually um in, in what city was your little village neighborhood chicago south side of chicago Sarah, uh, I wish I could put this story to you because if you looked at um, Ms. Hempel Chronicles' likes and Madeline is sleeping, you might think she lived in the 19th century in France. Um, she, <laughs> she, she lives possibly in California. Um, she lives in outer space. I mean, you, you seem to be the most connected, unconnected writer I, I've ever come across because you have access to place, but you also slip right out of it when you want to. Um, do, you, do you feel at all a longing for the kind of place connectedness that you, that's in, I sailed in Magellan or, or do, do you ever feel like, I, I wish I could be that person who wrote the Winesburg, Ohio of, of Boston, you know, near where you grew up? Well, it's funny because California is the first time I have felt that deep inspiration that comes from place. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I don't know if Boston, as much as I have fond memories of growing up there, I don't know if I could ever write a coast of Chicago or I sailed with Magellan about Boston, even though that is the site of this well of childhood memories and associations. Um, but but there's something about California that just sparks me um, in a way that no other place I've lived has. Um, and maybe it's because it's not the place I grew up. Maybe because there's always a way in which I'm looking at it through an outsider's eyes, um, despite having now lived here for going on 17 years, um, but there's, I, I can't, I, I still, I haven't lost my sense of wonder um, about living here. Uh, my, my, my daughter said to me, um, what, what is, she's, she's, she's on the verge of applying for colleges and thinking about leaving California. And she said to me, what is this that people, mean about California light. Like they just keep talking about California light. What does that mean? And I realized she's like a fish who doesn't know what wet means. Like she's, she's someone who has grown up entirely immersed in this environment. Um, and I said, well, it just spend one February in New England and you'll understand what people mean by California light. Um, but but I just I, I haven't lost, yeah, just just the the excitement about living here. And 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 I do think it has um, given me a sense of place that I never really had before. Mm. Well, you take us to your own private California to some degree in these stories and also uh, beyond. You also have the most perfect uh, rendition of the Revia uh, accent, um, <laughs> which I, I heard growing up um, as a young person in my early 20s in Concord. Um, uh, and I will not do any more accents because uh, I think Stuart would win that game hands down. Yeah, Brookline has a lot of dark freezing snow. Um, Sarah, it's been a pleasure talking to you about likes. Stuart, it's lovely as ever to see you and to hear you talk about her work in the short story. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, you can read more about, uh, about this book online at the uh, Alta Book Club. And um, I think it's time for David Eulen to come back, another uh, Boston guy, um, sort of. 
Uh, another guy who's never going to leave the state of California. I agree with you entirely, Sarah, about my, my entire imagination. My head blew off when I got here and I'm, I'm, I'm never going back. <laughs> so, um, so thank you all, Stuart. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you so much, John. This is a fantastic conversation. Um, so much to chew on and so much to think about. Um, the, in, this, this interview was recorded and will be available at californiabookclub.com. So check it out. Next month, uh, California Book Club will be talking to Natalie Diaz about her book, uh, Post-Colonial Love Poem. That will be on February 17th. Um, I want to remind everybody about the sale for the Alta membership for CBC members at altaonline.com slash tote. Please participate in a two-minute survey that will pop up as soon as this event ends. And stay safe, everyone. Um, see you all next month. Take care.